before um, and you put a smile on your face and you do what you have to do but inside something is bothering you and there were things that I realized that happened to me that I wasn't even able to see for myself so in the initial stages my head coach the head coach of the national team he pulled me aside after training session one day and he said are you he asked me if I was okay and I said yeah I was fine and he said the lady that I once knew I don't see her anymore Welcome to Beyond the Ball Podcast. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and the premise of this podcast is ultimately to provide stories, strategies, and successes to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And uh, today, I'm I'm really excited um, to to have another exciting guest. We have a very special guest in the building, and I'm going to go ahead and bring her out in just one second. I want to just introduce her. I want to introduce her appropriately, right? I want to introduce her appropriately. She's a professional athlete. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, she's a YouTuber. She's out here creating all kinds of, of, of content. And now without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring out Miss Shannon Thompson. How are we doing today? Hi, thanks Jonathan for having me on today. How are you? Definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So now I'm going to go ahead kick, kick the bike, kick the mic to you. <laughs> and, and I'm going to let you uh, just, just cover what I missed or, or give the people a snapshot out there if you know, this might be their first introduction with you. Shannon, please go ahead and, and, and take the mic. Okay, so yes, I am a professional volleyball athlete, um, but I also do a lot of digital content creating. So I love um, creating content for YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. If you think of a social platform, a social media platform, I'm probably on it. So. Okay, okay, fair enough. So so when did, well, let me let me say this, let me say this. Ha, has that always been a thing for you or because I, I know like content creation seems like like it seems like it's the new word. Right. right? So when, 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 when did you get started on which platform did you get started with first? I think the first was Instagram um, and then it would have been YouTube. I think I was always someone who was always taking videos and um, I love just like recording the moment. And so I was like. Why not? Why not put these videos on YouTube? That way, I always have something to go back to. It's almost like a little journal of my events and experiences. So that's how I started, really pouring myself into YouTube, just doing vlogs or like places I would visit. And then actually, um, coming from Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of my friends and family are always like, "Oh, I want to come with you when you go to Europe, or take me with you in your suitcase to Asia." So I was like, you know what? Y'all can live by Paris. They're like, we can have a shared experience if I have this um, this channel on YouTube and we can all feel like we're living the moment. So, wow, wow. Okay, so it so it so part part of the journey started by way of you wanting to create the experience for for your friends and for your family and definitely yeah. Uh, okay, that, that's that, that that's pretty neat. So what what type of what, what type of content do you typically cover on on your channels? You know, I know, but I'm I'm asking for the people out there who you know this might be their first introduction to you. What what type of content do you typically share, and what's the inspiration behind it? Okay, so I do a lot of vlogs, and um, when I go, as I said, when I go to Europe and Asia, and I experience like um, I don't know a tourist attraction or something, I try to just cover that entire experience. I also do a lot of my journey. So as a professional athlete, I would have gone through different experiences through my career. And um, I just try to share that very openly and authentically on my channel as well. So I have a lot of content around um, my injury. That's something that I experienced two years ago. And I I vlogged the entire experience from the operation straight down to um, each week of rehabilitation. So that's on my channel, as well as a little bit of faith, because faith is such an integral part to who I am. And it has shaped um, not just everything I do, but who I, who I am as an individual, my character. It's helped me in um, just being resilient through the different experiences. And it's something that I've come to a point where I'm like, I understand that we all have different beliefs, but this is a belief that has worked for me. It's something that has been a foundation um, that has helped me to stand through the test of time. And I'm just like, you know, when you have something that's so good, you have to share it with somebody. 
that's how I feel as it pertains to my faith. So I also share a bit of my faith on the channel as well. And I'm, I think I'm gonna start doing hair content. So <laughs> just look out for that as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there's there's definitely an opportunity because I'm sure, well, let me, let me just ask you. So when, when, you, when you go to Europe, are, are there many options for how you can style your hair or where you can get your hair styled and done or anything like that? <laughs> so that's the thing, right? Um, being a beautiful brown girl, you don't have many of people who look like me when I go to Europe and not many people who are able to comb my hair or even know what to do with it. And um, so that's something that I would have had to navigate for myself. My mother is a hairdresser, so I'd like to think that it was sort of always in my blood. Um, so just learning how to braid my own hair and just how to manage it, comb it in different styles is something that I've always been doing since since I left home at 15. So. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. And you said you left home at 15. So take, take us back into the story. We just dove in and when we started talking about content and everything else. So just, just take us back in, in your story. Like, like when, when, when this whole journey began, cause you just said you left, you left home at 15. So, so Shannon, talk to us, talk to us. It's crazy to even think about, like I come from the Caribbean, right? And that usually is associated with um, aspiring to be a doctor or a lawyer or going to engineering. And so um, at age 15, when I completed high school, I had the option to either continue my studies in Trinidad and do the A-levels um, or to go to college and start um, studying there at a university overseas or to begin my professional career. Now, I come from a family that's on either side of the spectrum, there are different fields. So on my dad's side, everyone is like into education. So we're talking principals, lecturers, school teachers, school supervisors, the full shebang. <laughs> and then on my mom's side, she's um, a hairdresser. So that's more hands-on and more creative arts. So when I said, okay, I want to be a professional athlete, the entire side of my dad's family was just kind of like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> did you did you say that I hear you correctly? And it was a challenge to um to really be able to pursue something that I knew in my heart it was is what I was meant to do. And I think at 15 years old, it's a young age to know what your purpose is and to be so sure and at such peace with such a life decision, major life decision like that. But um I did have the support of my both parents. It was not easy. As a matter of fact, <laughs> a lot of people don't know this about my story, but um, that caused a lot of tension um, in my family. And it actually resulted, well, it was a straw that broke the camel's back, resulting in my parents temporarily separating. And at 15 years old, that's obviously something really devastating. My sisters and I um, went through a difficult period of like navigating what it what it meant or having a taste of what this divorce it wasn't exactly divorce but what a separation um, feels like and the implications of that so that was challenging um, by the grace of God they did come back together but at 15 um, I did leave home I did leave Trinidad and Tobago while a lot of people were asking oh where are you going to study I'm like I'm going to study how I'm going to play this sport to the best of my ability. And so from 15 years old to I'm now 27, I've been playing volleyball professionally. And that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> well, I mean, you can you, you I mean, you, you definitely can take your time here with the story. You can take your time because I told you this is this is your platform. My platform, my platform is your platform. Right. But, but we, 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 we can't rush. We can't we can't rush because <laughs> how, how did you know at 15 that that this was something that you wanted to do or, or who was it who was further? you know, supporting this idea and supporting this concept, because that's a major, you said it, that's a major life decision. Exactly. And, and for you to come to that, how did you come to that conclusion? Okay, so before I played, um, before being introduced to volleyball, I was swimming with my sisters. I have three sisters, by the way, in case I didn't mention that. <laughs> um, and I, we were all swimming at the time, and I was also doing ballet. And I really loved it. But my fam my mother's friend, a family friend, introduced us to volleyball, each of us. And um, we all went to training session that day. And I was the only one who found a passion. I don't know what it was. Like, I literally say that it, it was love at first spike <laughs> as a volleyball action for those who aren't so familiar with volleyball teams. Um, and so in initially, I just knew this was something that I wanted to do. And as I continued in this sport, it was not easy. I feel like I've always had to um, just overcome certain obstacles or just 
be resilient in what people would have said to me or not think much of me, I was always the underdog. So when I was first introduced, I began playing, yes. But one year later, or even less than a year later, actually, the club had to close. And the guy who introduced us to the sport didn't want to just leave me out, out without playing the sport. So he got in contact with the national team and asked the coach if he would allow me to train with them. And he allowed me to. But for at least four months, the first four months of training with the senior women's national team, the head coach decided that I wasn't good enough. He was like, she's too short. There's no way. He's Cuban, and that's the mentality that you have to be told in order to be a successful volleyball player. And I definitely didn't meet the benchmark. <laughs> so he was like, you know what? If I put this girl on the wall every single day, maybe eventually she would just stop coming to practice and I wouldn't have to tell her to leave and never come back. He literally actually articulated this to me years later. But every day I would go to practice and I would set on the wall very diligently. I would do the drills that he told me to do. I'd always shag balls, run around behind these girls, help in any way that I could consistently, faithfully for those four months. And then he decided, okay, since this girl's not just gonna like stop coming, maybe I'll give her a chance. And one day he allowed me to join the drill with the girls and he saw that I couldn't jump. And so I was, okay, decided this girl, maybe maybe she can do something. Her limbs are long. Um, she's not very tall, but she has a, a good jump reach. And that's when he started to give me a little of attention and actually invested time into me um, to develop me as an athlete. So that was around age 11. Um, I joined the national team. I was selected to join the national team. I think it was a year later, and then at age 15, when I completed high school, that's when I um, became a professional athlete, so. Wow, so is, is, so is, is that normal, like around age 11, that, that, that the national team, that you, talk, just yeah, help, help me understand, because you said that was 11. I was thinking you were like 15 or a little bit older. So, so no, what does no. that typically look like? Because I, because I'm, I, I'm over in the states, and I know a large, a large portion of the of, of the listening audience is, is is within the states. So you know, typically it's high school, college, and then you know. So help help us just un understand uh, how, how how your process was. Okay, so in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a lot of club teams, and you can get involved in these club teams, and we have the club leagues where the national coaches would scout players. Basically, that's the chain of line um, to be recruited into the national team. So my my journey or my foot in was, um, I had a foot in the door, a, a bit of an advantage with the my club coach having connections with the national team coach. Um, but I was not recruited immediately to join the team. I wasn't selected. As a matter of fact, I remember very distinctly, there was another girl who was much taller than I was. Um, and she was selected to join the team before I did, even though we both began at the same time. So when I joined the national team, I joined at the youth level and then moved up the rank to the senior level. After I think I proved myself at the youth level, the head coach saw, the head coach of the senior team saw that I could be of help or of assistance or even an asset to the senior team. And that's how I was recruited into the senior team then. What was it that kept you showing up like every day? What, what were you telling yourself? Because I mean, four months like that, you, you were talking about some time. Like what, what, what were you, what was going through your head when, when you would show up and you like, Oh, go, go do this or go do that. You know, honestly, at that point, it was just raw passion. I was just so enamored with this sport. <laughs> I was like, these girls are, are amazing. I love the way that they played. And just seeing them train every single day and seeing their skill level, it was something that I aspired to be um, in the future. And I found it a privilege to even be able to just be at the same training session with these girls and learn from them, even if I wasn't actually included with any drill. So I also thought to myself that this is probably just how things go. This is maybe the general process that each player starts off on the wall. Later on, I would learn that that was not the, <laughs> that was not the case. But I think at that age, it was just um, the innocence and the joy that I found in this sport. And um, also the misconception that this was just how it was supposed to be. When you really think about the the sport of volleyball, what would you say that it's taught you? 
at, in, in regards to how those lessons can apply to your, your life outside of the sport? How much time we have today? <laughs> we, we, got, we got all the time you need. Lesson. Gosh, I feel like who I am today is because of, um, I believe that we're all shaped by our experiences, each one of us, right? And because at, a, at such a young age, I was faced with setback. I was faced with a coach who told me, oh, you're too short, or oh, you're not good enough. I've always had to be resilient. I've always had to exercise that muscle of resilience and just fight against um, opposition. And so throughout the course of my life, so at age 15, I was like, okay, um, no, at age 11, sorry, when I when I was first told, oh, you're too short, I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to keep going. And I, I proved him wrong. I proved all the naysayers wrong, and I was able to make the national team. And then at age 15, when um, my community, as I said, growing up in the Caribbean, where education is the route to success um, or the perceived route to success, um, and me saying, okay, I'm not going to take that route. I'm going to find my own path. That was something, again, that I had to go against. And everyone who said, oh, but what if you get an injury? And what if you, um, what if all these things, there's a lot of negativity that I just fought against and, and found my own way, you know? And then at age, uh, I think it was, I don't want to give incorrect timelines, but let's just say a few years later, um, after being, oh, right after being recruited to this first team where I spent my first three years, um, I got there and thought, okay, I made it to the professional life. We're going to play and have fun. And the coaches were like, actually, we don't think you're ready as yet. So we're going to leave you on the bench for the first two years until we think you're good enough. And I would be proving myself time and time again in training sessions. And I just wouldn't have the opportunity to play. And as an athlete, especially someone who left such a, a um, far come from such a far way from home to go to different countries like Poland, um, to be told, okay, you just came all the way here, sacrifice being from family and friends, simply to stay on the bench and just be a cheerleader. That was really devastating, but it was something that I decided I'm going to fight for because this is my passion and this is what I, this decision, this is the decision that I made. And so I fought against that. And um, at the end of my, at the end of my second year, I assisted the team in staying in that league and won MVP consecutively for about the last six games. And that was like where I showed the team, okay, she's an asset. And the following year, I was then only starting six and things were much better. But just to learn that when I got to, um, when I went to Poland, that new team, Honestly, it was because they wanted my other friend, because it was both of us from Trinidad and Tobago who went, and they really wanted her more, but they said, okay, we'll take a bit of a package deal and we'll bring her as well. So it's just, you know, different oppositions. And so I was able to, um, to go through that challenge and make it to the top, thinking, okay, the following year after this, my career will take off. But that, that was not the case. The following year, um, it took a while for me to find a team and um, I was recruited into a team in France and it was an okay season, but again, I wasn't recruited as a starting player. I had to prove myself again, just coming from the bench, doing the best I could in training sessions, fighting for my spot until at the end of the game, um, at the end of the season, I proved myself and had a career high of 41 points um, in a professional league. So that was a big moment, a big moment of achievement for me. The following year, I thought, okay, I finished really strong in this season. I'm going to a high league. And when I say high league, I'm, I'm thinking a league like um, in Asia or um, in Europe, like Turkey, Russia, one of those things. Uh, but that didn't happen actually. It took a very long time again for me to find a, t um, a team. And halfway through that season, uh, I was recruited to join a team in Russia, yes, but I was not um, an asset to that team. Again, I was just proving myself from practice. I actually went there because one of their players got injured. And so I went to fill that spot, but I was just a, pla a practice player for the entire um, rest of that season. And so that was difficult, but what was even more challenging was that the year while I'm fighting against um, being in a cold country, you can imagine an island girl in Russia fighting to make her spot, to make her name on this team. And it just seems as though practice after practice, nothing is happening. 
Um, so dealing with that, dealing with my professional career and trying to uh, prove myself in that area, I also suffered the loss of my boyfriend. And so in 2015, uh, while I was in Russia, I remember waking up one morning, my mother, she sent me a message on Facebook and she was like, I have some sad news. I immediately, like my throat, my stomach, my throat just sunk. And she was like, um, Aki, committed suicide. I'm like, what? What do you, what do you even mean? It was, I remember that day so vividly. Um, yeah, that was something really difficult to deal with, just being isolated. And being in Russia, I also didn't have many friends. I didn't have any friends outside of um, outside of my teammates, actually. We didn't go out much. So I'm in this room by myself for these six months, trying to deal with making it on my team. My, my career not going the way that I hoped. And now my boyfriend just committed suicide back in Trinidad, and I'm not even there. I was allowed two days to go back to Trinidad literally so it, it was a total of six days but it took me two days to get back to, to fly back to trinidad they allowed me two days at home and then two days to return so i got to go just for the funeral to put him to rest and go back to russia and i felt like like i stayed in trinidad and my body went back to russia it was devastating years later you know just fighting and battling with um with grief trying to navigate this new world of grief and this new world of life um after grief or, or life without him was a challenge like i feel like in that point in time i was in a dark hole i remember thinking that and the thing about grief is that you only like those who know know and you can only be able to truly understand it when you experience it and as an athlete not being able to um, be with close friends and family when you experience the loss of a loved one is something that's a challenge um, to navigate as a human being and as an athlete because at the end of the day, you still have to show up at practices and give your best performance. You still have to show up at games and give your best performance. And you have the coaches, you have your teammates, you have sponsors who are all depending on the investment that they've placed in you to achieve a common goal for the team. So that was a challenge. And just, you know, going through years later, I then faced injury. It was, it's, it was the craziest situation because I was recruited to a team in Germany, had an amazing season. Um, and then the following year, the, head, the championship team, the coach of the championship team reached out to me and um, asked, for me to join the <laughs> to join to join their team, I was so excited. It was crazy because I remember thinking I got the message on April first, and I remember thinking that this was a prank. I was like, I don't know who set this guy up to this, but I genuinely believe that it was a prank. Um, so I left the message there for a few days until I returned and saw, okay, it's still there. Maybe this is real, and that's when I re I re responded, and that season. I played for um, Allianz MTV Stuttgart. Unfortunately, so this is going to be my championship, Champions League debut. And it was a dream of mine to always perform, um, participate in the Champions Volleyball League. So I was extremely ecstatic. However, when I got there, I arrived in October. And then in November 2019, I tore my plantar fascia. The video is actually on my YouTube channel where you see the game starts and literally the first point of the match, I jump on my second attack and I tear my plantar fascia. That was extremely difficult to deal with because I here I, was, here I was thinking, okay, this is finally my big break. I'm finally going to like be the top athlete that I always envisioned myself to be, and now I'm facing with now I'm facing injury. The doctor pro, um, progno, gave me a prognosis of six months, six weeks, sorry, to recover from that injury. So I said, I calculated it and said, okay, um, I can still make it in time for some Champions League games. Everything is going to be okay. I'll be able to end the season with the team. However, as I began doing rehabilitation, there was a problem with my knee. Uh, my, there was a tear in my left meniscus, um, the meniscus on my left knee, and the doctor said that I had to operate that operation completely wiped me off for this season. So what would have been my shining, defining moment turned into a, a, 
a season of disappointment, a season of um, one way the true definition of resilience was tested. I felt as though um, if I professed to be a resilient person, any time before then, <laughs> this was the time to just be able to dig deep and find that spirit of resilience inside. And I did. I decided that I was going to be an asset to my teammates, even though I wasn't able to contribute to the on the court. I decided that I would support these girls. I would. I found um, a hobby in baking, so I'd often make baked goods for the girls to go on their away trips, and um, just be just be a light for them. And that's something that I was able to do. Um, unfortunately, my season, my contract for the following year was cancelled. The team decided that they were not going to renew it. And so, again, that was just another huge disappointment. Nevertheless, I persisted. I said, you know what? I'm still going to keep going. This is something that, this is a dream that I have inside of me. Um, I have people who have spoken into my life and said that certain things will come to pass. And I have not seen it as yet. And I will not stop until I see it. And so I returned to Trinidad and I continued my rehabilitation there. And then at the end of last year, I was recruited to Fatum Nide Kaza, and this is a team in Hungary. And I had a lot of support from the fans in Germany and just different people who would have followed my um, sporting career throughout the years. Uh, they just really wanted to see me win. And so when I got recruited to the team in Hungary, it was one of the top teams and they were in the running to win the cup as well as the championships. So I decided, okay, this is going to be a win for all of us. And I'll be able to make everybody proud, make myself proud, and just be able to show me more than anyone that, yes, there are difficult periods in life, but I can emerge from it and I can be stronger and I will succeed. However, <laughs> I got to Hungary and I arrived just before Christmas. And... Um, we had a short break for the Christmas celebration. And in that time, I did a lot of test medical examinations with the team. So they did an MRI on my knee just to ensure everything is good, everything is healed, to ensure that they were getting a quality, um, healthy player. And I passed every single one of those tests. Even now to the weight room, uh, I remember one of the, I remember the physio, um, the fitness trainer, sorry, of the team. She gave me all of the exercises and we did a weight testing and she told me, you're the strongest girl on the team. I said, well. <laughs> so I was really excited about those little wins. And then my first training session with the team, I tore my ACL. One bad step and my ACL was completely blown out. And this was in the opposite knee to the knee that I had operation on the year prior. I, I just couldn't understand. I was like, what is it that... What, what is happening with my life? Why is it that I'm, I'm getting injured? Why? You know, I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of questions for God. Um, my faith was really tested at that point in time. And when it happened, I didn't tell anybody for, I think, a solid week. I just kept it to myself, not for shame or anything, but just because I was so shocked by the situation and in disbelief that, that my season was yet again completely over. Um, and in an instant, it was really difficult for me to deal with. And after some days of just quiet and questioning, and it took a while before I cried because I said I was in so much shock. But eventually, again, I just purposed in my heart. I, I made a decision, and I believe that a lot of major things or great things happen at the point of decision. And when I decided that this is not going to be the end of me, this is not going to be the end of my career, and I will still exercise the spirit of resilience, that's when I got up and said, okay, let's just be active. What is the next step? We're going to do an operation. Let's get this operation done. What is the next step? Rehabilitation. Let's do this rehab. And that's the point that I am at right now. I'm in the rehabilitation process on the road to recovery um, to full health. But one of the things that, one of the questions that I believe were answered um, as to why this had to happen. I believe that uh, sometimes we have to be planted really deep in order for us to really or truly blossom. I believe that the deeper the roots is the taller the tree. And it's it's so pertinent to our life when we think of how low we get emotionally, um, how low 
you know, we go into ourselves. I think the further down we go, it's it just may be a clear indication as to the height or the grandeur, the purpose that is within that situation. And within this time frame, I've been able to write and release my first ebook for athletes. And I've been given a lot of vision of things that I want to do, not just for myself, but for the tribe that I believe that I'm called to lead. Um, a tribe of people or young women who were told that they weren't good enough in whatever career path, who were told that they weren't tall enough or strong enough, um, or didn't look a certain way or didn't fit, fit the aesthetic, who would have experienced grief, who would have experienced loss. I believe that I'm called to lead that tribe and show that we can stand resilient. We can emerge out of difficult situations and, um, and be stronger and thrive and bloom. <laughs> That was a lot, but <laughs> wow! I'm sitting over here like, man, what? Whoa! Wow! Oh my goodness! Yeah, I mean, that's your your perspective is so rich. Like it's it 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 it, it really is. Very rarely, very rarely in today's society, I would say. Well, very rarely have I met a person with the perspective like you have. Because we're talking about grief. We're talking about like grief of a loved one. But then in addition to that, grief of not, not even necessarily grief of career, but like the injury and then the injury and then. No, I mean, that in itself is grief. There are different mm -hmm. types of grief and you can grieve. You can grieve dreams. You know, it is the death of a dream. It is the death of something that you would have thought was going to happen and didn't happen. So you're very accurate in calling that a form of grief as well. Yeah. I, yeah. I almost call it grief of the moment because it was the mo like you were, you had the vision for the moment. You're like, Oh, it's time. You lace them up and you go on the court. And it's like, oh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh man. Wow. But I think when you have inside what you know you're meant to do and when there's a light with this, you see, Faith is such a huge part of my life. And I think that's why I preface this entire interview by saying that because when your foundation is, uh, when your foundation is built on um, on faith and faith in God, at least for me, it's the anchor that literally holds me through the storms of life. When you think of a boat, when you think of a vessel, you think of um, a vessel and it's on, it's on the wave and the storms come um, blowing that vessel back and forth. When there's an anchor, it doesn't matter how much that that how much that boat tosses tosses and turns. It doesn't go anywhere because there's something that is unseen that keeps it anchored, and that is what faith is for me. That's good, man. That's so good. Wow, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think as well um, that when you when you go through grief as an athlete. Not everyone understands it, right? So you have to show up at practice every day, as I said before, um, and you put a smile on your face and you do what you have to do, but inside something is bothering you. And there were things that I realized that happened to me that I wasn't even able to see for myself. So in the initial stages, my head coach, the head coach of the national team, he pulled me aside after a training session one day and he said, are you, he asked me if I was okay. And I said, yeah, I was fine. And he said, the lady that I once knew, I don't see her anymore. And at that point I realized, okay, I like, like something has to change, <laughs> you know? And I'm a person, I'm always laughing. I'm always having a lot of fun um, playing volleyball. That's what, one of the places that I find most joy. And to see someone um, identify the light that was dim because of the situation that I placed, that I, that, um, that I faced was something that um, I was grateful that he was able to bring that to my attention, but just understanding that grief is something that has to be walked through. It's not something that can be covered up. It's not something that can be overlooked. Um, pain demands to be felt. It doesn't, you can't just, over, you can't just sweep it under the rug and keep it going. You have to face that beast and say, okay, this is what I feel. And I'm going to allow myself to feel what I feel in a healthy manner. Um, and after navigating that, after giving it, giving your pain or your grief that space to stretch out, then you can deal with the situation. Then you can attend to the, um, to the wound. Only once the wound is finished bleeding, then can it be attended to. 
And that's something that I had to learn for myself and just be really patient with myself through that entire process. I know what it's like showing up to practice literally with tears in my eyes. I know what it's like when the coach stops you in the middle of practice because you aren't doing a drill accurately or because um, something isn't going the way it should in practice and he's screaming at you and you immediately began, begin crying, not because of what he's saying, but because it's an extremely difficult day because something triggered um, and a well of emotions that you can't quite articulate. Um, but if there's anyone, and I want to speak to the, to the grieving athlete, I don't know if you're listening to this podcast and maybe you've experienced the loss of a loved one, especially in these COVID times, a lot of people are losing their family members and it's really devastating because, um, I think at this point in time, it's very difficult to find closure in loss just because of these circumstances where, you, um, at least in Trinidad for one, there's a minimum of five people that can attend funerals. And um, if it's a COVID funeral, if it's a COVID related death, family members can't even bury their loved ones for risk of, inf of um, viral infection. So it's a really difficult season to lose somebody at this time. Um, nevertheless, I want you to know that someone understands what you're going through, especially as an athlete, as trying to navigate your career and um, having all of these goals and dreams as well. It's okay to rest. It's okay to let your pain stretch out. It's okay to just sit in a room and cry or not. It's okay to just sit in silence and just allow the thoughts and memories, like whatever comes to you naturally in a healthy, and I always stress in a healthy manner, do just that because your pain has to stretch out. It demands to be felt. Listen to what you need at that for that time and in that season and go through it intentionally. If it means finding different books, um, one of the books that I will highly recommend that really helped me in my grieving process is a book that called, that's called It's Okay Not To Be Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't remember the author right now. I wish I could put my hands on it. I have my book shelf right, right at the side of me just trying to skim through quickly if I can see it. But that is a book that really helped me understand my pain, um, understand what it means to grieve and um, allow myself to go through that experience. So allow yourself, even if, even if it means taking time away from the sport for a minute, do just that. Your goals and dreams can't um, be accomplished if you're not in the healthiest frame of mind or space to do so. And don't let anyone rush you out of your process. You know, there's people say, oh, you go through this cycle um, of denial and, uh, Gosh, I don't remember the exact cycle right now. You, you know, have you, are you familiar with it? Where there's like the different stages. There's denial and then um, acceptance at some point. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of. I'm trying to think of it and pull it up at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember it um, in a minute. But in that cycle, it's not, it's not linear. For one, um, there it can come, it ebbs and flows. It can come in at different points. The different stages of grief can come at different points. They can revisit. It's not like, oh, when you get through one point, then you just keep going and you've accomplished it and you can move on to the next stage. It doesn't happen like that. It goes back and forth until you've come to a place of true healing. And I do believe that healing mm -hmm. is a continuous work. It's a work that requires intentionality um, and listening to what you need at that point in time. So I just hope that any athlete that may be going through or any person that may be going through grief or loss at this time is really patient with themselves and patient with the pursuit in the pursuit of their goals, knowing that you're not late. It will happen like your your future and your goals and dreams will happen when it's meant to. And one of the quotes that I absolutely love is by Morgan Harper Nichols. And it says, one day you will look back and see that all along you were blooming. And if I go back on my life now and I think, oh, Shannon, at 15 years old, she wanted to be a top athlete and she, you know, I just wanted to be the best of the best and have like the biggest contracts and all these different things. But I think of if I, if I got what I thought I wanted at that point in time, I wouldn't be the individual that I am today. I wouldn't be able to relate to certain people on a soul level where I can't, where, where I'm able to not just say, oh, I understand what you mean, but I empathize with you. Why? Because I've been there. I've walked those shoes before. I know exactly what it feels to be in the space where you are right now, to feel as though you're in an area or in a career path for a long time and have not yet seen the manifestation of what you know is inside of you. I know what that feels like. 
I know what it feels like to just um, have to go against the green or have to be um, be resilient or constantly feel like there's a fight. And what I love about the season that I'm in right now is because is that sitting, having this interview with you, I'm not having this conversation for a point where, oh, Shannon, MVP of Champions League <laughs> is now speaking with Jonathan about, you know, I've not yet accomplished what I know is inside of me and, and the um, fullest of my potential within the sport. But I am sitting in the boat with you. Like, I'm not standing, when I, I, I just changed the narrative, I just, I'm not standing on the shores and telling you, oh, you can make it to the other side, just keep swimming. No, I'm in the boat with you right now. Um, there is power, I think, in this moment that I'm in right now. I'm being able to relate to people while I go through certain things so that we could go through it together. Shannon, thank you so much, <laughs> man, for just, 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 just coming on the platform and just pouring out your heart. Like really just just pouring out your heart from from a true place. And just like you said, from, you know, not not being, you know, off on the side or here or there, but being in the boat. Yeah. 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 Please. I mean, please. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, that's just one of my desires that like more than anything else, um, people truly see the heart behind the ways that I see. And I always hope that my experience or my life um, is just a testament of one, God's faithfulness and his promise to fulfill every good word that he says or he spoke over my life, um, as well as just that God's love is, is really just shown through me, that I'm a vessel where he's able to that, like pour that out um, on people, through people. Um, I just hope that you you feel loved through an interaction with me. You know? so I'm glad that you're able to see my heart in this. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Let let people let people know where they can where they can find you and where they can connect with you. Um, just you know, just 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 in the future. Oh sure. So I'm very active on Instagram and on TikTok at Shannon underscore D Cannon, and that's Shannon with a C <laughs> underscore D Cannon. Um, and I'm on in, on Facebook and on YouTube at Shannon Thompson. Again, that's Shannon with a C Thompson. Just my my name. Excellent. Excellent. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you get ready to get out of here. We're going to get ready to wrap this thing up. But before we do, I have to run you through uh, what I call the two minute drill. This two minute drill. I've listened to your podcast. <laughs> I was like, OK, I'm ready for it. Let's go. <laughs> OK, what if I switch the questions up on you? Oh, you know what? <laughs> so you try it. I'm ready. That's funny. That's funny. So are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> OK, OK. Here we go. Favorite food? Sushi. What 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 roll? Oh, you know what? Anything with salmon, mango, and avocado. Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, okay. What what's what's the last book you read? The Four Agreements. But I don't remember the author right now. The Four Agreements. It was so good. It's so freeing. It just like just read it <laughs> the four agreement uh miguel ruiz i think his name is i, I read that earlier yes i yeah. think that's the guy yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay we go. what's your go-to streaming show of preference i'm currently watching blacklist my mother and sister has been watching that show it's it just keeps you on toes. <laughs> but it's good okay okay what, what's your favorite podcast Gosh, I listen to so many different ones. Okay, I'll, I'll say my most current podcast will be this one by Michelle Anna. Um, it's it's called The Flourish Effect. It's a really nice podcast. And she's actually someone that I connected with, uh, I think, through different courses and then on Clubhouse. And um, why I connected with her so deeply is because she also experienced grief and she, uh, she lost her husband and she's now just flourishing and living a life that's just thriving and pouring into so many different people. It's amazing. So, I love okay. it. Excellent, excellent. And then lastly, who is one guest that, well, no, 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 we're not there yet. Well, I'll, just ask, I'll ask it now. Who, who, who's one guest that you would like to see me interview next on Beyond the Ball? Hmm. At the top of my head. You know, the first person that comes to mind is my friend, uh, Crystal Asdell. She's also a national athlete from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, she has an interesting story <laughs> as well. And um, I think she can be a great guest on this show. 
Excellent, excellent. Last question. What's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? What's one tip you want to leave for a student athlete? I would say to be patient with the process. And I know it's not cute. I hate the word patience myself. But when they say trust the process, it, there's so much depth within it because every experience that you go through is shaping to be is shaping you to be who you will be in the future. Um, I would say to embrace every stage of the journey and understand that it's an integral part in who you will be in the, in, in the future as well. And um, I just want to say that you can do it, and anything that you desire is yours for the taking. Excellent. One more time, let, let the good people know where they can find you, how they can follow you and connect with you, Shannon. You can connect with me on TikTok, Instagram, at Shannon underscore D Cannon. Feel free to send me a DM. I reply to them all. And you can also find me on YouTube. That's where I share a lot of my journeys and travel experiences. Also look forward to hair content, <laughs> um, as well as on Facebook at Shannon Thompson. Excellent. Excellent. Shannon, thank you so much for, for coming on. And, and like I said before, for pouring out your heart and, and sharing your story. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to look forward to uh, the updates. I'm, I'm going to look forward to the progress and I'm going to look forward to seeing the tree sprout. And continue <laughs> to sprout. Thanks for having me today, Jonathan. Certainly, certainly. You're more than welcome. To all the ballers out there, I know you all just heard this amazing episode. Make sure, make sure that if you were listening to this, then you might even want to go back and, and watch it on YouTube because, I mean, you, you, you get to see our, our beautiful faces. But um, anyway, uh, be, be sure be sure to connect with Shannon and shoot her, shoot her a screenshot, send her a DM, let her know what you took away from the episode, how it encouraged you. But then follow her. Be sure to follow her. And uh, she provides amazing content on YouTube as well. So I would encourage you to subscribe to her channel. But all the ballers out there, I want you all to be encouraged. And also want you all to know if there's a topic or if there's a guest that you all would like me to have on uh, or there's a topic you'd like me to cover, please feel free to shoot me a DM and, and we'll definitely make sure that we cover those and then shout you out out but everybody thank you so much for listening if you have not subscribed to the podcast subscribe 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 and if you feel that we add value to your life in any way shape or form it would mean a ton if you left an apple review but family we're about to get out of here i'm jonathan jones and this is the beyond the ball podcast where we help you succeed beyond your experience.